Hi everyone! I've been waiting for a decent night to do this video about planetary imaging and processing since last October. The weather's apparently been record awful and now the planets have all gone pretty much out of season. Uh, nevertheless, I set up the other night thinking I could at least get a quick capture and it actually rained on me and my poor telescope. So I've decided to just show you what I do from here in SharpCap on some older data that isn't terrible, isn't amazing, and then we'll process that same data in Autostacker, Registax, and GIMP. To be really fair, I don't need to be outside for this because I've already recorded my whole setup process, which you can find here. Um, so I'll just pick up from where that video ends. Before starting, this is just to say, as always, that this is how I do things, not to present it as the best way, not to present it as the only way, Everything that I've learned, I've learned through talking to people um, with some very generous astrophotographers who took the time to give me advice and through trial and error, mostly error. <laughs> so when it comes to my process, it's still not really set in stone and I'm always looking for ways to make it better. But to explain a few things in advance, I have to say that one of the best pieces of advice that I have received uh, was from somebody who did absolutely incredible planetary imaging, and it was to shoot to my conditions, basically adapt my planetary imaging to where I am and what my location demands. Um, as many of you might know, I'm in Brighton, which is on the southeast coast of UK. Um, we have the South Downs range behind us, and also being right by the sea, it's at negligible elevation as well. These things are basically the worst for planetary imaging because it means that seeing is rarely better than awful, and seeing is pretty much the alpha and omega of planetary imaging. I am determined to do planetary imaging anyway, but if you're wondering why I do this and don't do that, just be understanding of the fact that I have to adapt and what works wonders for somebody in Florida or even an hour inland from me won't necessarily give me the same result. Um, if you're in a better location, you can absolutely uh, stack fewer frames or go with a less noisy imaging and it will probably give you a better result overall because the seeing is better overall. But this is a result of a lot of trying things out and this is what worked best for me personally in the end. The main thing, and this was again advice given to me that has served me really well over time, was to combat my seeing conditions by prioritizing frame rate. Basically to try and freeze the atmosphere as much as possible and that means probably more than it's usually needed. Um, this influences a lot of my choices when it comes to settings, but also when it comes to which camera I chose to image with. Um, you may have seen from previous videos, I used the ZW662MC, which I guess is now the older model because they have since announced the 664MC and some new planetary cameras. Now, I'm going to say something which I hope won't land me in astrophotography jail, but I don't think that there are enough practical differences between so many models of planetary cameras by one manufacturer to warrant such a sheer flood of models on the market. There is so much choice out there and even when they improve sensitivity or the QE goes from 91 to 94 percent, um, often that comes at the cost of speed. So basically I went with the most sensitive camera that still had the minimum frame rate that I needed. And the new version 664 is unfortunately already slower. The other thing is that this camera has 2.9 micron pixels, which absolutely, yes, it's oversampling, um, as it often is with planetary cameras at this sort of focal length. However, I will show you what a regular night looks like around here. But uh, when it comes to my equipment choices, when the conditions are decent, the lucky imaging will work for the oversampling. Anyway, when the conditions are bad, there is no correctly sampled and well pixel matched imaging train that will help me get anything decent out of Brighton sky soup. Um, you might call it an aggressive setup, but I prefer to push the scope 
and try and get something decent out of it every once in a while. So basically, how does this work? I'll show you all the settings in SharpCap that I do to maximize my frame rate. Um, and I'll go for a very tight region of interest and low exposure, but I'll offset that with a higher gain. This will introduce noise, which in turn will be offset by the fact that I'll capture a lot more frames, which will then hopefully be good enough to stack. I hope this makes sense. Um, so basically, this is planetary imaging from coastal in England, aka putting lipstick on a pig. <laughs> so starting with a few things to check before imaging. So first thing you want to check is that your USB 3 ports are actually functioning as USB 3 ports. I say this because my previous laptop, which was also a Dell Inspiron, had three USB 3 ports on paper, but actually only one of them was supporting USB 3 traffic. Uh, you want to check that your cables are working as intended and also that you don't have any bottlenecks. Now here in SharpCap in the lower left corner is your frame rate. If you're not imaging, then it shows a test speed. I've seen this twice now where people had a very high frame rate in the test speed, but when they actually started imaging and actually writing to the disk, that frame rate suddenly dropped through the floor. If this is the case, you want to go to Task Manager and check for any bottlenecks. There's a few settings that I like to keep as my default. The first is to capture in SCR format. Rather than selecting it every time, I've gone to Settings and set SCR to be the default capture format. Now, in the right-hand tab of SharpCap, I've selected Max Frame Rate, Turbo USB, and Max Frame Limit. This will all ensure that I'm getting the most out of the camera. Finally, for Planetary and Lunar, you want 8-bit. Going to 16-bit doesn't really get you anything because you're already shooting at high gain and it only slows you down. Picking up right after the previous video, I have cooled, collimated, aligned, focused, and now it's time for the actual capture. When it comes to gain, this is the one that I don't tend to change around much. Planetary cameras work best at higher gain. Around 70% is always a good starting point. I set mine to anywhere around 400 on the 662 camera. For the region of interest, I choose the smallest one that allows the planet to fill the frame, but leaves a little bit of space on either side for corrections when it inevitably drifts a little bit. My mount is altazimuth, and it can't really track to that sort of minute precision, so I choose the slowest speed on the handset and just do tiny corrections when it drifts. So just a very short press on the buttons to recenter the planet during capture. With exposure, I've learned not to be afraid to go dim. Uh, the planet doesn't have to look on screen the way you would want the final image to be, if that makes sense. Once you stack thousands and thousands of frames, it will all brighten up. So I decrease the exposure until the planet is really dim, but some of the most contrasting features are still showing. Now, once you've chosen your region of interest and decreased exposure, your frame rate will go right up, but there's a limit to how fast the camera can go at a particular region of interest, after which decreasing exposure doesn't really make any difference anymore. So you can bring the exposure up until you hit the point where the frame rate changes. Basically, I choose the highest exposure possible for the particular region of interest that still has the optimal frame rate. I hope that makes sense. The final thing is to hit record, and now comes the question of how long. There is a time limit to how long you can image, as biggest example, Jupiter, without experiencing the effects of rotation. And you'll read different timings, like don't go over 60 seconds, don't go over 45 seconds. I would honestly recommend, and I think it's worth taking five minutes just to test out if you're truly seeing much difference between, for example, one and two minutes. Uh, a lot of this advice would have been written by imagers with big, wonderful telescopes who might be seeing a lot more of these effects of rotation than me with my home nine and a quarter inch. Or it's just become standard practice to mention these numbers in planetary, and they just get repeated over and over. Again, advice that was given to me by a phenomenal imager 
was to freely image for two minutes and then cut that in half and compare if I'm really seeing that much difference. I did that and honestly, apart from being noisier, the shorter captures were not really different in any way. So don't take my word for it. Take a few minutes and test out what your length would be like. But I personally do two minutes on Jupiter. Um, you can always cut that video in half and compare. And also in SharpCap, in the capture box, you can select your recording to go by length and it will stop at the time cutoff. Right, so now I'm going to process an older image of Jupiter. This was caught on November 3rd. And this is actually one of the first images I did with the nine and a quarter inch CPC. I used the ZWO662 MC, a two and a half times power mate, a ZWO ADC, and a UV and infrared cut filter, all of which you can see in the previous video. Um, this was not a fantastic night when it comes to imaging. Um, I've had better and I've definitely had worse, but it's recent. It's done with the whole setup from the previous video. And I have a whole list of settings for it that I can show you. Um, and I also think mediocre is a really good result to show for this. As you can see, my gain was at 412, so pretty high that evening because the scene was murky, which is average around here under the jet stream. Exposure was at 3.34. And as you can see here, I took a two minute video at 204 frames per second for a total of just over 25,000 frames. I'm going to start in AutoStackert. Now, this is the new AutoStackert 4. I keep the noise robust at 6 for planets, and I think I saw somewhere that Emil himself recommended that. The alignment points are set to local, and now I'll hit Analyze to see the quality graph. Now, this quality graph is pretty smooth and consistently going down. If there were a sudden drop in the green line somewhere, that would mean that there was a big difference in quality between frames. But this shows me that they're all more or less consistently meh. Nothing fantastic, nothing terrible. When I have a graph like this, I will stack as much as I feel like I can get away with. And that goes in hand with the fact that I chose a high gain. So I want lots of frames to decrease the noise with. I go with 75%. The normalized stack here is selected to default. So is RGB align. The only thing I uncheck is the light sharpening option because I want to do my own sharpening from scratch. Now with alignment points, I will deselect close to edge because that's given me some issues in the past with Jupiter. And I'll select the alignment point size that will give me a decent two digit number. 72 usually works fine for me and stack. Now taking it to Registax, I have to say I don't have any presets because every image is done under different conditions here. I play with the settings sometimes and see what works best for that particular one. Um, I'll show you what I do every time, and then I'll show you how I process this one, because obviously I've done this one before. First thing I do is the RGB balance. This is always a necessary one for me. So if I click here, it will correct all the colors, and now they're much closer to what I want. And then the second thing you can do is double check the RGB alignment. But because I used an ADC and Jupiter was quite high up, it's already aligned for me. Now on the left hand side is the case by case basis stuff. In general, if the night wasn't downright awful and there's some smaller detail to fight for, I'll pull the first and the sixth slider all the way and then denoise them. Then I'll pull five and four and denoise those two and then start sharpening to see how much I can add without making things look garish. The closer I get to the first slider going up, the less aggressively I do the sharpening. And finally, the first slider will be the last bit with denoising as I go. I'm actually going to stop here because I find that it's quite hard to find that fine line when you've done everything you can with an image before it starts going into overdoing it territory. Um, it's tempting to keep going and keep sharpening and keep trying to squeeze that last little bit of detail. And I've definitely overdone it before. I think it's because Registax does such a great job initially of getting you somewhere from seemingly nowhere and then you feel like you could do that sort of leap again but i've learned hopefully that there's a diminishing return on trying to um, get more detail out of an image that wasn't made in the conditions for it and also i'm not a huge fan when the main belts become too contrasting which is what happens the more you keep sharpening 
it's a personal preference and it's not a crime. The only crime is using topaz and thinking nobody will notice. But I'm going to stop here. After that, I take it to GIMP for some saturation or any further color balancing it may need, and also to resize the image so I can post it for others to see without it getting hit by the social media compression a lot. Everything that gets posted on Facebook, Instagram, and such will be in PNG format and 2048 pixels on the longest edge. I hope I get to record a really good planetary capture this coming season, but basically this process is how I got the whole solar system. Of course, these were the best of every planet. Um, for reference, I just want to show you the final image that we just did. And this is what I was seeing while capturing. This is an average seeing night here in Brighton. You can actually see the jet stream. This is what Saturn usually looks like for me, for example. Uh, this is from a night which I would say was a pretty good one. This was captured with the 8-inch SCT, and here's the finished image. I'd say I get about three to four nights like that in a season. And here I've imaged almost the exact same side of Jupiter in great and average seeing around here, so you can see what the difference it makes to the final outcome. Hopefully this was helpful or just gave you an idea or two on how to get started. Clear skies, everyone.